Chapter 12 in the international relations class is talking about the north-south gap or the rich versus poor gap. In the previous lecture, we talked about the colonialism period and how that served to create this rich versus poor divide. So now let's talk about current conditions. State of the South or the, the poor countries of the world, we have about a billion people in the world that live in abject poverty. Average income of South Asia is about 4,800 per year. In Africa, it's only about 3,200 per year. We'll look at some tables here in a minute. In undernutrition, even though that might not actually cause the death, it's linked to 3 million child deaths each year. Here's the richest countries of the world. Right here, some of these are very small, but this gives you the list of the richest countries of the world, United States, right here, looking at the poorest countries in the world. But the biggest thing you can see here is the incredible difference in GDP per capita, almost 60,000 right there, but uh, not even 1,000 in, in some of these states here, barely above 1,000 per year in GDP per capita. Looking at a table here to where we have the world average, showed you that an earlier slide, around 13,000 GDP per capita, and only about less than about 30 states, richest countries in the world, are above that average. The vast majority of states are below that average, as you can see right here. Between 1990 and 2013, we have seen some measurable significant increases. Income per person in the Global South rose from 3,000 to 8,000 overall. Global North rose from 20,000 to 40,000. So there's a higher rate of growth in the South as far as percent increase. But the gap between rich and poor countries is, in, is increasing, as I talked about early on with globalization. That's one of the drawbacks of global capitalism is that inequality will increase, even though everybody in general is improving. 2010 UN Millennium Development Goal, number of people living in extreme poverty is cut in half. So they are constantly updating those goals in order to focus on problems such as this. Looking at the needs of humans throughout the world, one in six worldwide lack safe drinking water, well, about one-third are without access to sanitation, 50% of India, 25% of India's population lacks electricity. Also, one in six of the world's population is in substandard housing or homeless so what the UN does is has created a alternative way of measuring a country's standard of living through the Human Development Index. We call this the HDI. And this gives us a few more indicators rather than just GDP per capita, which obviously can tell you a lot as far as your consumption of your society. So that gives you an idea of your productive capacity. But the Human Development Index, HDI, also includes a few other indicators to try to determine the, how healthy, in general, your society is. So life expectancy is a, a health measure. Mean years of schooling and expected years of schooling is an education measure, very important to the uh, success of your society. And they also include gross national income per capita is part of that measure. So the HDI is just a, an alternative method of trying to get perhaps a more comprehensive idea of that country's standards. Looking at the top countries in the world, there's not a whole lot of surprise here as far as the states that have the uh, highest human development index Norway, Switzerland, Australia, Ireland, Germany, in the United States, down here at number 13, still very high. 
So this gives you a chart of the top countries in the world with highest human development index. But what we see there is, is somewhat of a paradox with HDI because some of the richest countries in the world do not have that great of an HDI. For example, Qatar is number one in the world in GDP per capita, but ranks 33 in HDI. Brunei, number four in GDP per capita, but 30 in the world in HDI. So you can see that even though they've got a lot of money, in this case uh, petroleum money, it's not necessarily being transferred to society at large. Kuwait, number five in wealth, but down the list, 51 when it comes to HDI. These states are a little bit more in line with their HDI and their GDP. Saudi Arabia, number 12 in GDP per capita, but number 38 in HDI. So that shows you that somewhat of a paradox there between those two numbers. The poorest countries in the world are the least developed countries. This uh, is going to be a theme throughout the rest of the class here is that the poor countries have had a hard time becoming not poor. It's very difficult to make progress. And since the, the least developed countries list was developed back in 1968, there's only been five countries that have actually graduated from this list of least developed countries. So that shows you how difficult it is for them to develop and improve their economic situation. At the heart of the obstacles to development, are they are political in nature, as which we've alluded to several times during the class. The lack of confidence in the stability on which trade and investment depend is very crucial as far as overcoming these obstacles to economic development. And when we look at the top factors that prevent investment, prevent improvement in their economy on trade and, and just internal domestic uh, economics, it's conflict. Politically unstable countries potentially have more conflict. There's more corruption. The resource curse is where the states are relying most predominantly on oil as their major resource and therefore use that oil to fund their governments and breeds corruption as well as uh, vast inequality. And when the prices of oil goes down, then that severely hurts their ability government to provide basic services. Infrastructure is necessary to have investment in successful economics, whether it's roads, clean water, even internet, electric grid, education, and the government is centrally responsible for all of that. And if the government is continuing to be unstable, then that continues to be a disruption. Therefore, overall lack of government services. So almost, you know, and one of the things we've talked about here, relying only on one ma major resource, well, yes, that's a function of ge uh, geography. If you don't have those resources in your, the boundaries of your state, well, yeah, that's just bad luck or just a matter of um, territory. But everything else, as we see on this list, revolves around political instability. A couple of other things to talk about here. Hunger, food insecurity, 800 million people around the world are chronically undernourished. The poorest states and consume less than 60 grams of protein per day, which is less than the, the daily requirement. In many of the poor countries, subsistence farming, which means just farming by individual families in order to survive on a day-to-day -day basis, that is counter to the concept of liberal economics to where you combine your, or you, you could say industrialize your, your agricultural system and then become major exporters. 
but that's hard to do when most of your population relies on day-to-day -day subsistence farming. Commercial agriculture when then therefore rely on certain types of cash crops for exporting, which may not be the type of crops that uh, their farmers are generally producing. So that would require transition, government support. Here's an example of some trade-offs. The International Convention for the protection of new varieties of plants. This is where Ghana was debating whether or not to adopt this. So there's lots of trade-offs, lots of questions. Do you want to be subjected to the patented corporate seeds or stay with your local crops? The patented corporate seeds would then benefit the multinational corporations that are making those, but at the same time, it would it would get help to get you off of the local subsistence farming. The trade-off here, larger yields, which could help your exports, perhaps improve your overall economy versus the freedom to replant what you want to plant. Increasing exports, as I said, if we were together politically on that, could improve their overall economic situation. Otherwise, farmers could stay trying to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we're saying here is not about what's right, wrong, good, or bad. It's what in this global capitalist system has shown to improve economies better than other things. 90% of Africa's food production comes from the small-scale farmers. You know, this could help describe a couple of things, whether or not it's their main... Uh, source of, of income, but also it shows that it may not be as efficient. If you have, for example, a hundred people or a hundred families working one acre at a time, so that's a hundred families working a hundred acres in order to survive on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas if that was industrialized, so to speak, then you could probably have maybe 10 people farming 10,000 acres, which is you know vastly more efficient. And then that would free up those workers to go work in other jobs. So that's what's happened in the industrialized countries. And again, we're not saying that that's the right way to go. That is what has shown some, con as far as considerable improvements in the economy when that transition is made. And then, of course, the trade-offs is that the multinational corporations also gain more power. Seed companies control 53% of the global seed market, which could potentially put the poor countries at the mercy of their profit interests. There's also the rural versus urban divide here. 70 to 90% of industrialized states' populations live in the cities, and it's increasing only 50% of China is urbanized. So there's still quite a bit of movement from the agricultural sector into the urban sector. The urban population, and this, there's reasons why people are attracted to that, has been associated with better education, higher incomes, particularly with, with younger populations. It's more interesting to live in populated areas where there's more things to do, more people to interact with. Land reform has had mixed results. This is where attempts to redistribute property to the poor for subsistence farming. That has not played out successfully in general and typically resisted by the, the wealthy populations and as well as the multinational corporations. The uh, horrendous examples that came about under Stalin and Mao is also still somewhat of a detriment, detriment to pursuing those types of uh, policies. Women have made tremendous progress, particularly in the developed countries, not quite as much in the poor countries, but the involvement of women has been long considered a key to development because you are improving your brain power, you're putting more people to work that are capable and interested in working with the same cognitive developments and uh, try to improve your economy, but discrimination is still quite prevalent in many of the uh, poor countries in the world. Two-thirds 
of illiterate adults worldwide are women. So women are still lacking in many of the poor countries as far as schooling. A little more than half of women in Pakistan receive primary school. 30% of college students in China and Middle East are women, whereas in America, it's over 50%. This concept of microfinance, uh, an Indian economist started this up in the early 2000s and won the Nobel Prize for this. This is where people could, could go online and invest in families in poor countries that were starting to start a business. And for the most part, women were the, the main recipients of these loans because the women typically handled the general everyday business affairs for families in poor countries. And the, the rate of return on those investments was astounding, to say, to say the least, as to, which showed the responsibility of the women that were generally targeted for these loans in order to use those loans productively and pay back a return on that investment. So that was not just a, a Nobel Prize winning program, it was also a fascinating revelation when we see the uh, involvement of women in these programs. Now, keep in mind that this microfinance program is just one of several options in order to try to improve the situation of poor countries, but would certainly not be a major fix because it's just a very small amount that can get in the, to the families in this way when major reforms and aid and development is what's required. Looking at migration and ref, refugees, most industrialized states, are, and this is increasing a little bit, particularly when you see some of the growing anti-immigrant sentiment, even in America, typically limit migration from the South, typically from the, the poor countries that are looking to come to a, a developed country for more opportunity. But refugees are also fleeing wars. The anti-immigrant sentiment that's currently now, even in America, was triggered somewhat by the wars in the Middle East, Syrian war, which created a lot of refugees going into the EU, even fleeing disasters and floods and droughts, which are going to be projected to increase with the prospect of global warming, political persecution. So there's a lot of people in these poor underdeveloped regions that are looking to go elsewhere and the, the rich countries not necessarily wanting them to come there. Over 15 million international refugees in 2014 alone uh, internally displaced about 30 million. So there was a lot of activity in the 2010s with the wars in the Middle East. The war in Syria, for example, generated alone th 3 million uh, refugees and 6.5 million uh, displaced persons. Remittances is where the workers cross the borders into a more developed country and work over there and then they send that money back home to their relatives. And because they can make so much more in this developed country, they can send a lot of money back and support their families. By doing that, Mexico, Mexican immigrants to the United States is a prime example. When um, immigrants from Mexico come over across the border, almost instantaneously, they can make about five times more money than they can make if they were in their home country. So that's a pretty uh, attractive incentive to cross the border, which is why we have a substantial illegal immigrant population, but they come over because they can find work. And that money that they make is sent back home and can raise their families on that money. A approximately $600 billion was sent back across borders to the poor countries in 2016 by these workers, these migrant workers, and that is three times more than the total amount of foreign aid that's sent from the rich countries to the poor countries. So that shows you a pretty uh, interesting comparison there. ODA is just the, uh, the term for official development assistance. That's the money. We'll, we'll talk about that more 
later, that's the amount of foreign aid that rich countries send to the poor countries. Now, one of the advantages of this remittances is that it goes directly back to the families. They typically go to a place like Western Union and send that directly back to their families so it doesn't go back through the government. It's not subject to conditions. So it does have a little bit more efficiency there as far as getting back to the families. But still, a long way to go for that to translate to economic development in their own country where they would not have to cross the borders into another country to get that get those jobs. And so that's one of the arguments about this is that when migrant workers are continuing to go to the rich countries to get work, that continues this cycle of dependency that we've already talked about, even from the Marxist viewpoint, that the poor countries therefore continue to stay dependent on the rich countries by doing this. And also, if there is a recession in the rich country, that is the biggest hit to migrant workers because then they are not going to be able to find as many jobs in the rich country, such as in the recession. Illegal immigration decreased dramatically during the recession because of the less jobs available. Now, one of the th talking about disease, health, you might want to ask yourself, what are the leading causes of death in low-income countries. And here's where we see an interesting comparison. In the poor countries, there are several causes of death that could be prevented. In fact, they are, for the most part, prevented in rich countries. For example, diarrheal diseases, HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, preterm birth complications, birth asphyxia, and birth trauma. Those are, those are the top 10 leading causes of death in poor countries, and most of them are preventable in rich countries. But as you'll see when we get to the rich countries, there's kind of a trade-off because as countries get richer, then they start still having to deal with, with heart disease and strokes because of the lifestyle of the of the rich countries. So as we go from poor countries dying from a lot of these uh, situations that can be prevented, there's, there's vaccines, there's preventions for that. Looking at the 10 leading causes of death in the United States, you can see the, uh, the differences here. Clearly uh, cancer and heart disease overall when we look at the totals, clearly the top two causes of death, and then when you look, as you go down the list, there's, there's none of those that we saw earlier that were the pre preventable type diseases in, in our top 10. Interestingly, the uh, unintentional injury has jumped up to number three because that includes the overdro uh, drug overdose deaths, particularly from the opioid crisis that we've been seeing. So that's why that's jumped up to number three. And then you can see by age group, unintentional injury, which includes the drug overdose deaths as well as traffic accidents and things like that. The top cause in the 44 below age group, suicide also very high in the 34, 10 to 34 age group. That drops down dramatically when you look at the overall numbers. So that's a comparison of poor country versus rich countries, causes of death, Looking at more at the health differences between countries, the EDCs, which is the economically developed countries or rich countries, they spend 15 times more on health care than the LDCs. So that's a, a function of your health infrastructure, which, of course, requires quite a bit of political involvement as well on that. When you look at things like Medicare, Medicaid, S-CHIPS, child nutrition, things like that. There's 10 times as many physicians, which has a function, a function of their education system, five times as many hospital beds. Child mortality is 16 times higher in the poor countries. 70% of children under five in the poor countries die from these infectious parasitic diseases that we just talked about that are preventable. Only 1% in the, in the rich countries. So you can see some dramatic differences there between rich and poor 
Globalization is part of the interaction of trying to prevent infected people from entering foreign countries. We're dealing with that right now. Global coordination is quite essential to prevent that from happening. Early detection and control, most important strategies. Crisis response, we'll probably be learning a lot about this current crisis that we're in. Containment, monitoring, quarantine, treatment, research, cure. These are. This is a global problem that's going to require global s- solutions. It will be interesting to see what happens in the aftermath of this current pandemic. The example of the WHO is a is a good one, particularly, well, not the WHO, but the WHO, particularly in the campaign against smallpox. 180 years were to, to elapse when Jenner disco- after Jenner discovered the vaccination between we finally uh, eradicated. The missing elements were not scientific knowledge of technical capability because we had that, but rather the logistical infrastructure and international political will needed to undertake such a vast and costly campaign. So what happened, why this is such a fascinating story, is because the two superpowers back in the 50s, United States and Russia, got together and delegated it to the WHO, get rid of smallpox. And within 11 years, they eradicated smallpox. It's a um, very uh, interesting success story of the WHO, of how collective action can work. The post-colonial dependency still exists. We, we talked about how the colonial period, which lasted around 400 years or so, and then somewhat locked in this rich versus poor divide. Well, after the colonial situation, we still have some dependency. Poor states are narrowly developed to serve the needs of the, of the home country. The, they continue to be vulnerable to price, price fluctuations of the primary products. So if they're still becoming, or, or if they're still stuck in being exporters of primary products, then they could be at the mercy of pl- price fluctuations. As I've said, the WTO does allow poor states higher tariffs in order to protect their domestic industries, but also promotes liberalization of trade so that we can find the best product for the best price. So that's that's a dilemma that we're still trying to sort out. Here's the map that we saw earlier that the poor states are still heavily relying on exporting of primary products. These are just the basic ores, minerals, materials, basic agricultural products that are, are sent over to other rich countries for them to develop into products and commodities and perhaps even export those out to other countries. So the more the poor countries remain dependent as primary product exporters, the more they are, tend to remain as poor countries. So that's just one of the parts of this equation here. Looking more at dependency restructuring, as I've said, it's dif- difficult because it takes political stability to do that. They've also were put in countries where they inherited their borders. Corruption is still quite a problem in the poor countries. The the centralized control, therefore, is not as productive if, uh, if you've got this instability that's still in the, uh, the underlying economic conditions have not changed significantly. So in the next chapter, we're going to be talking about that more specifically. And the dependent countries must therefore get either get foreign aid or borrow money in order to try to develop. And just like I've said before, a rich country or a financial institution is not going to want to lend money to a country that's unstable, where they might not get that investment, a return on that investment. So this is what we call the enclave economy, where there is a, a sector within those poor countries that might be seeing some benefits primarily to local workers, but not necessarily translating to the country at large. The multinationals are therefore reaping the benefits for the most part of this globalizing economy. As we talked about, the local benefits are mostly going to rich owners within the state. So this is a recap of the rich versus poor divide in the world. So next 
chapter we will get into international development in a little bit more detail.